Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for our ears being anointed to hear and our hearts being anointed to receive from you. And Father, I thank you that you will speak through my vocal cords, think through my mind. None of you, none of me, all of you, none of me, all of you. And I pray, Lord, that somebody will get answers today. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, verse 7. We've been talking about how to defeat the devil in your mind. And today, our focus is going to be the battle of the mind, the battle of the mind. Your mind is the arena of faith. Your mind is where the battle takes place. And the Bible says for us to be aware that we have an adversary who has come to kill, steal, and to destroy, but Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. For those of us who understand what Jesus has done and we understand the power of God's grace, we are not trying to defeat the devil. The devil has already been defeated. He is a defeated foe. We are not trying to get the victory. Jesus has already obtained the victory for us. Our job is to maintain what he has already obtained. So this is not where, you know, I'm going to wake up this morning and I am going to defeat the devil and get the victory. No, the devil is defeated and Jesus is Lord. Amen? The victory has already been obtained. But we've got to understand there is strategy that's formed against us, strategy to try to humiliate and undo. He can't undo what Jesus has done, but to try to, to make a mockery of what Jesus has done, to try to get us to think that it's not done. The greatest fear that a believer can have is the fear that what God promised won't come to pass, the fear of what God has done that he really didn't do it. And so his job, again, to kill, steal, and to destroy, he, 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 wants, to, he, wants, he wants you to be miserable in every sense of the, of the word. The way he does it is through your mind, your will, your emotions. Your mind is the, is the center point, the resting place of your emotions. And so emotions will move you in a direction. If they're good emotions, they'll move you in a, in a good direction. If they're bad emotions, they'll move you in a bad direction. And I'm telling you, when you get emotional, if you don't recognize that this is the enemy, enough to at least be quiet. The Bible says a man that can control his tongue can't control his whole body. There is a daily strategy to try to attack you in your mind that is real, that is serious, and that is something we want you to look at today as we look at and evaluate the battle of the mind. I, I subtitle this, Watch Out for the Landmines. The first place that your enemy will attack you is your mind. Your mind is, your, your, your soul is what we call it. Your, we, we, we have, over the years, we thought the soul, we use the word soul and spirit interchangeably as if they are the same. You are a spirit being. You have a soul. You live in a physical body. That is the tripart being of a man, the anatomy of a man. You are a spirit. So when you leave your body, the real you leaves the body. 
You are a spirit being. Say out loud, I am a spirit being. Now, you possess a soul. Now, your soul is interesting. Your soul is made up of your mind, your will. See, you have a choice in everything. Your will, you didn't slip up and cuss. You made a decision to cuss. <laughs> your mind, your will, and your emotions. Emotions. Uh, and so, the enemy understands how can I disrupt your soul, your emotions, your thinker, your feeler, your chooser. That's where he wants to make the impact to try to bring destruction in your life, in your thinker, your feeler, and in your chooser. Your mind is the arena of the battleground for your life's output. See, nothing just happens out here. Your, your mind is the arena. It's a battle for the output. And if he can affect inwardly in your mind, your will, and emotions, he can also affect the output. And so the battle's not won once he gets out here. You cutting somebody ain't winning no battle. The battle has already been won, and you've got to maintain that up here. Up here, he's going to tell you it has not. And up here is where you've got to over and over again said, I already have the victory. I already am righteous. I already am delivered. I already have wisdom. I believe what, this is what it is. It, it, is, it is believing that even when you're looking at something that contradicts that, you've got to know how to play this chess game in a sense. And it's up, it's up here. You'll hear things that'll move you emotionally. Hear things that'll anger you. Hear things that'll hurt you. Hear all these kind of things. And you've got to understand that is an attack that has been launched against you. That's where it starts. The fear that starts when you go to a doctor's office and they got bad news and, and they tell you the bad news because this is what they saw, this is what they diagnosed, and everything about you wants to settle for that except you know something in here that he's trying to change that if you'll keep it, it'll change the output. Oh, my God. But if he can stress you in here and that stress begins to transform into the physical body and into your emotions and into all of the outputs that come from what he can cause you. That's the battle. That's the battle. And so you will lose or win in life based on how you handle and fight in the battle of your mind. You will win or lose in life based on the, how you handle and fight in the battle of your mind. Please remember it, ladies and gentlemen. Please remember, nothing just happens. What's already on the outside? Look at the outputs you have already. All of those outputs came as a result of the battle in the mind. Now, so let's go through it. I'm going to give you the warnings of some landmines, some things you need to pay attention to. And right here he says in Proverbs 23 and 7, he says, for as he thinketh, then in his heart so is he, eat and drink, uh, eat and drink, saith, uh, eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. So, as a man thinketh, that's what's going to be in his heart. Your heart makeup is going to be made up of what you've been thinking. So, the question is, what have you been thinking? What have you been thinking all the time, every day, often? What have you been thinking? That now becomes a part of your heart. Now, once it gets in your heart, that's where, that's the shoot, if you will, that releases it in, the output into life. Let me show you this next scripture. Look at uh, Proverbs 4.23 in the NLT. Proverbs 4.23 in the NLT. He says, to guard your heart 
above all else. Guard your heart before all. It, 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 in essence, your heart is the soil that'll grow things. Just like you have soil and you can put seed in the soil and it'll grow food, your heart is, is, is the soil that grows the output. Your heart is the soil that grows life. Hmm. Guard your heart, therefore, above everything else. That's a pretty powerful statement. Above everything else, put a guard over your heart. Now, how are you going to guard your heart? You're going to have to guard your heart by discovering the, the entrances into your heart. How many different ways into a man's heart? Well, there are three. Through the ear gate, what you hear, deposit seed into your heart. Through the eye gate, what you see will deposit seed into your heart. Through the mouth gate, a lot of times what you say, if it's not lining up properly, will deposit seeds into your heart. Once it's in your heart, it has the potential to grow and produce life. He says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above everything else because it determines the course of your life. Next verse. Now, notice what he says here. Verse 24, we're going to keep reading. He says, avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. What is he saying? A gate, a gate, stuff that's coming through these gates. Go to the next verse. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before. There's the third gate. There's the gate. We, we as humans in society, people outside of Christ, they don't think about stuff like this. They're just wondering, how come that happened? And look who gets the blame. How come God let that happen? There's a devil loose. We, 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 we think no big deal. And it's a big deal every day. Eye gate, ear gate, what comes out of your mouth? He said, fix your eyes on what lies before you. Next verse. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. What is he saying? All of the stuff that comes through those three gates and they get into your heart will eventually get into your feet and you'll start going that way. Oh, my goodness. You'll start going that way. So what are you to do with this information I'm giving you right now? What are you to do with it? If, with this information... You, can, you should be able to change your outputs. You should be able to change your outputs. Now, of course, you're going to need God's help. Of course, you're going to always need God's help. But at least you're understanding the anatomy, the makeup, and the system by which the strategies of the enemy are being formed and formulated against you to try to take you down. But what he really wants you to do is to not believe it. Ignore what your ears, your eyes, your mouth. Ignore your heart. Ignore the, the different paths. And just think, this is my life. I'm going to live it the way I want to live it. You know what? You are a free moral agent, which means you can make a choice, and you can live it any way you want to live it. You can frankly do anything you decide to do, but it may not be good for you. Are, are you listening to me now? So that's a landmine you need to be aware of. We got to start thinking about what we're thinking about. When was the last time you sat down and you started thinking about what you're thinking about? Think about what I'm saying right now. <laughs> when was the last time you sat down and started thinking about what you've been thinking about. And that's my question. What have you been thinking about? Whatever you focus on the most, that has the most power and strength to determine your output. So what have you been spending most of your thought life with? Somebody says, well, that's what an addiction comes from. Of course. It's whatever you spend your time doing the most, thinking the most, watching the most, that's what you end up doing. This is, what, this is how life works. And God knew it because he created us. 
Let's look at this second mine, landmine. What are your ears exposed to? Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 21 through 25 in the NLT. Mark chapter 4, verse 21 through 25 in the NLT. I, I, I you know, I, I was all, I've, I've, I've always tried to, well, there's got to be some balance in this. And this is the reason why I believe God had me to teach on this battle before I got, I've got like three more messages in, the, in that year-long series on grace. And the next one is about Christ, the preeminent one. And preeminent means no one or nothing holds a greater value and position than Jesus. Watch this, verse 21 through 24, I think I said. Then Jesus asked them, would anyone light a lamp and then put it under a basket or under the bed? Of course not. A lamp is placed on a stand where it light will shine. For everything that is hidden will eventually be brought into the open, and every secret will be brought to light. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Then he added, pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given and you will receive even more. Now that, that's what, that, before I read verse 25, that's what anything, especially you single people who go on a date, pay close attention to what you're listening to because that person will tell you everything about themselves. Well, I don't understand why I keep drawing the same kind of no good for none man because you keep ignoring what's being revealed at the very beginning. You're not paying attention to the things that are... Listen, somebody told me one time, if somebody tells you they are a fool, believe them. <laughs> but you sitting up there, you're just so, you're just so, oh my God, look at, look at her beautiful hair, or oh wow, look at his eyes, and you, you ain't listening. You're not paying attention. Somebody said, is that the devil? Oh, no, it might be. Getting your attention off paying attention. You're not hearing. The man telling you, I'm a fool. And you're like, ooh, my baby's going to have nice hair. Look at that hair. <laughs> he said, there's something about paying close attention to people, to where you're going. Pay close attention. Then he said, verse 25, to those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who are not listening, even what little, they under, uh, un, little understanding they have will be taken away from them. There is something supernatural that's happening right now as you're seated here listening to what Jesus has to say. He's going to give you more. Some of you, gonna, some of you probably getting more while I'm talking. But when you leave here and you listen closer, you, you, you're going to get more. You're going to understand more. You're going to see some, some illustrations in your life because of how you're listening. And that's what we got to do as Christians. We got to, we, we've got to get to a point where we want to listen to God's Word. Let's listen to God's Word so I can hear it, so I can see what's going on. Yes, I love inspiration. Yes, I love shouting and dancing and, and lifting hands and talking in tongues and having a fit. I love all of that, as long as you don't turn nothing in church. I love every bit of that. But then there comes a time when you got to listen. If you're going to do all of that, and when the time comes to listen, you nodding, dude, you're not, you're, you're not, you're not listening carefully. You, you, you probably see the Holy Ghost right now because you're nodding just so quick. Lord. You don't know what's going on. There is a power that is invested in the person who's careful how they hear and how they listen. And the enemy knows that. And he's, he's hoping you don't listen. Because it's amazing how when you don't listen to God's Word, how open and available you make your attention to the things that are not God. Isn't it amazing you try to teach your kids something, but let them hear somebody cuss on TV. They'll remember that quicker than anything. 
and your kids would be coming around just saying that same cussing word. Blank, blank, blank. Be like, baby, where you get that from? Mm -hmm. and, and some men them know something wrong with it. <laughs> this is the battle. This is the battle that still goes on today. Now, this is a big one here. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 in the NLT. Colossians chapter 2. In fact, let's, let's start at verse 6. Let's read verse 6, 7, 8, and 9 in the NLT. Number 3, here's a landmine. Beware of the philosophy of men. Let's define philosophy. This is where we left off last week. Philosophy is a theory or attitude held by a person or organization that acts as a guiding principle for behavior. A theory or an attitude held by a person or an organization that acts as a guiding principle for behavior. So it's a theory. It's an attitude that a person or an organization came up with. Doesn't have to be truth, but this is what they decided to use as a guiding principle for how they behave. Now listen to what the Bible says about this. You, you just don't want to adopt somebody's principle. It's like the norms and values of the world. The norms and values of society says, if a whole bunch of people of society think this is right, then it's right because all these people think it's right. Those are the norms and values of society. Society gets together, and they take a survey, and they say, I don't think nothing wrong with this. I think that's fine. And then now it's right, not because it's really right. It's right because the norms and values of society has set this as being something that's right. And then you adapt it. And then when, if you're not here when they did that, then generations down the line, it becomes like a norm. Of course nothing's wrong with that. Of course that's right. And that's why the Bible says there's coming a time where people will call the things that are wrong right, and then they'll call the things right wrong. I think we're already there on that one, aren't we? <laughs> Verse 6 says, and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him. Mm. Not, it, not into the philosophies of men, not into the norms and values. Let your roots grow down into him. Let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world. Did you hear what he just said? No, here's the part. I'm looking. He says, don't be arrested or captured by human philosophy. By, first of all, he says he calls it empty philosophy. He, and then he calls it high-sounding nonsense. Do you know the norms and values of the world has, they have taken on, believed, and, and fought for high-sounding nonsense that comes from, watch this, comes from human thinking. And watch this, and it comes from spiritual powers of this world. That's demon powers. That's demonic influence that norms and values have set as being, this is fine rather than from Christ. We got a decision to make. Either you're going to allow the world through the norms and values of the world to set your thinking, either you will allow the philosophy, empty philosophies to set your thinking, and the devil bets on that. The devil says, if I can give you my philosophy, and if I can get you to believe my philosophy, and hey, while I'm at it, let me set this philosophy towards norms and values of the world, and then you might tend to believe it more. How many of us have been seduced walking around with a philosophy that came from human thinking and demonic influence? And you will put your whole life on the line for something that was demonically induced to a human mind and produced an empty.
filthy philosophy. That's what we are. Because we ignore Christ. We don't pay attention to him. We don't keep our focus on him. We're seeing what the great poet says, and we're seeing what the great philosopher says. And oh, my hero politician said this. And oh, you know, the, the, the preacher who don't preach out the Bible said that. And oh, that, oh that, that, that's, that's deep right there. That's, you know, we say stuff, and it, and it come out with a rhyme and a shine. Ooh, 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 that was deep, that was deep. But did it come from Jesus? Or is it really empty philosophy? <sighs> I was invited to preach one year at uh, the seminary at uh, Morehouse. And my friend, Dr. Carter, I don't know if he's still there, he was just so amazed with my preaching that I would stand up there and preach the Word of God. I don't care who disagreed with it or not. I think that amazed him more than anything. He's like, I absolutely don't agree with the words you're saying, but I'm intrigued with everything that you're saying. <laughs> and he invited me two years in a row, and I'm thinking, how do, how, do, how do you do that? And we became friends. Don't be tricked or seduced by empty philosophies. That's how the enemy gets into people's head and into people's lives. You start listening to philosophy. And listen, I'm a former therapist. I found that the scriptures were more effective than the philosophy that was supposed to be used to help people. I look at some of the people that came in, I'm like, this ain't going to work on you. I'm going to tell you that right now. Let me go get something Jesus said and make it sound like it came out of one of these books. <laughs> For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. He says, pay attention to that. I wonder how many people will walk out of here today and set themselves up to be duped. Wonder what commercial would get you. What speech will get you? Wonder what, I wonder what hero will get you. I wonder what famous actor will stand up and say something and you think, oh, that's great. Wonder what poet will get you. What empty philosophy is going to invade your thinking today, opening the door for demonic influence based on that way of thinking instead of Jesus' way of thinking. Uh-huh, ain't nobody shout here today. I love it. I love it, boy. Let's look at this next land, landmine. Life comes through the Word. Let's go to Psalms 119, verse 36 and 37 in, in, in the NLT. Psalms 119, 36 and 37 in the NLT. I want to move quick because I want to show you how to win this battle. All right, now watch this. Now, we, you know we live in a world where people believe that money equals success. <laughs> That's an empty philosophy. I, 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 my heart go out to you because when you get it, you're going to realize why, how come I don't feel successful. You can afford a $5,000 suit, but ain't nobody there to tell you you shop. You can buy a $300,000 car and don't nobody want to ride with you. And you can buy the biggest house in Atlanta, Georgia, and ain't nobody in there but you haunting the house alive. <laughs> Man can give you medicine, but only God can give you healing. You can go out and buy a home, a house, but only God can turn it into a home. You can go buy your friend for the night, but it ain't going to be genuine love and relationship. It's all about your bag. So that ain't it. 
And neither do we go to the extreme either and say, well, I'm, I'm just going to be poor because that's what Jesus wants. Jesus wasn't poor. You should see some people looking at me like, he what? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Uh, you remember Judas? You, you remember the guy named Judas used to travel with Jesus? What position did he hold? What does a poor man need with a treasurer? Yeah, but brother, all the Bible says foxes have holes, birds of the air have a nest, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. All right, you've been conned. Now, put the text back in there. The context was they were traveling, and they were going through a village where there was a lot of racism against them. And they heard about Jesus was coming here. They said, no, you can't stay here. Not today. You can't stay here. And he tried to tell his disciples, because one of them wanted to call fire down from heaven, from heaven again. <laughs> do we do like Elijah and call fire down? He said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. <laughs> he said, foxes have holes in this village. Birds of the air have a nest in this village. But the Son of Man don't even have nowhere to lay his head in this village. That's why we're going to the next village. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? And for years, we bought the idea that Jesus was the lowly, broke, poor Jesus. Peter wouldn't believe that because Peter needed to pay his taxes. And Jesus said, I got you. And said, fish. He said, look in the mouth. You'll see money for his taxes and go and pay mine while you're at it. We bought it. And then many taught it. But he says in verse 36, give me an eagerness for your laws at that time rather than a love for money. Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. Are your eyes focused on worthless things? when life can only come through his word? Where's your focus? Where's your focus? Taffy said this morning, everything about right now is about focus. God wants you to focus on Jesus, and Satan wants you to focus on everything else. But what happens when you focus on Jesus? You remember, I think it was Peter again, uh, Jesus told them to go ahead, and there was a storm, and they went ahead, and Jesus went to pray, and then he caught up with them. But they saw, they saw at the time they thought it was something. The Bible says they thought it was a phantom or a ghost walking on the water. And, and the, the, the disciples, they weren't trying to hang around. You know how, you know how we do. We ain't even got to know what's going on. We can be walking, and somebody run. We run with it. What are we running for? So Peter said, if it be thou, bid me to come. So he put Jesus' back against the wall. There was nothing else but one thing that Jesus could do. Because if, what was Jesus supposed to say? It be, not, it be thou not me? <laughs> if it be thou, bid me to come to you on the water. So Peter, Jesus said, come. So Peter, we, we, put, we try to put the, 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 the solution on the word come. Mm -mm. Peter got out the boat, focused on Jesus. Look at the focus now. All right, now pay attention to what happened. He got out the boat, focused on Jesus. And watch this. He kept looking at Jesus. And while he was looking at Jesus, he was doing something a man is not supposed to be able to do. A human being can't walk on water. A human being can't defy gravity. What happened? He was focused on Jesus long enough, and as long as he was focused on Jesus, he entered into the dimension of the supernatural. Y'all get that? He's here. 
Y'all don't hear me. He can't see nothing else but Jesus. And now he has tapped into the dimension of the supernatural where the super has raised him above the natural and he's doing something you're not supposed to be able to do in the natural. But when you focus in on Jesus, you focus in on God in Jesus, you're looking at the supernatural and you're invited into that dimension. So he steps out of one dimension of the natural, steps up into the dimension of the supernatural, and defies natural law. Watch this, watch, watch this. And Satan said, well, I got to stop this because man is about to find out how powerful he is. Oh, my God, do you want me to go there? I had a conversation with God about this the other day, and, and I'm thinking, like, don't, you're not going to have me teach that right now because I don't know enough. And he just said, I want you to share some of that right now. Now, watch this. Listen to this. When Adam and Eve were created, God, we're not going to finish this today. Bro. When Adam and Eve were created, they were not created mortal beings. Mortal meaning, uh, excuse me, they were, they, yeah, they were not created mortal meaning to die or an end. You're mortal. We're mortal because we die. We don't live forever. Man was created immortal. Man was created never to die. Guide me, Lord. Adam and Eve were never supposed to die. They were ir immortal beings. Mm. Satan comes in. Listen to this. And distracts them in their thinking. You want to know how you can be snatched back from the dimension of the supernatural? Let him start talking to you about your thinking. When he looked at Peter walking on the water, he said, notice what's around you. Look at them waves, boy. Feel that wind. He said, huh? Oh, oh. All right, watch this. And he began to sing. Because Satan could disrupt the thinking or the focus that can lead a man into the supernatural dimension. Follow me. So in the garden, Adam and Eve, now Eve was talking to him and said, uh, we're not supposed to eat this. The day we eat it, we're going to die. Watch the devil. Watch his desperation. Just outright lie. You will not die. God said you will die. He said you will not die. How much has God said to you that the devil turned around and said that ain't going to happen? What is he trying to do? I can't afford to lose you to that supernatural dimension because if I lose you to that supernatural dimension, I won't be able to do this to you no more. Follow me. And then he turns around and says, you don't need God in the garden. You eat this fruit, you can be just like him. You don't need him. Why would you need God? Do y'all hear what he's saying? This is, I know I'm, I'm, I'm teetering on this real thin line. Why you need God? Let, let, me, let, me, let me, can I read it between now just a little bit? I'm finna go there, I'm finna say it. Why you need God when you were made like him? He knew that, stole that from us, and we can't possibly even fathom. And he told you in the Bible, what is man? He answers the question. What is man that you are mindful of him, that you visit him, that you made him a little lower than yourself, Elohim? Now, I know I ain't God, you ain't God, nothing like that, but we have access 
to the same dimension. And we've shown up, got access now that we're in Christ. But even in Christ, we, we still limit what God's trying to bring. There's got to be a reason why we're going through all this. There's got, why, what was God up to before Satan came into the garden? Man was supposed to be immortal. What was, what was God getting ready to do with a man that's supposed to live forever and ever and never die? What was his plan? And of course, he had to grow. He had to mature. And Satan showed up to humiliate God's plan and tried to turn his, one of his greatest creations just like he turned the angelic creation. You know how he turned them? Don't depend on God. Depend on yourself. Declare your declaration. Make a declaration of independence from God. Declare that you don't need God. That's how he turned a third of the angels, and that's how he turned the entire human race. So he says, I got to go and fix this. I'm going to lay the plan out a little bit at a time. And he who tried to humiliate me, I'm going to humiliate him. He said, God, look at your prize. They sinned against you. Oh, Lord, this is so good. Watch this. <laughs> ha. Your angels, a third of them turned against you. That, 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 a third was like millions. He said, okay, <laughs> you think you know what you're doing, don't you, boy? You forgot who made you. <laughs> Little boy, you don't, you don't understand. You don't understand. I know you, boy. So, all right, here's what we're going to do. Oh, here's what we're going to do. You think you humiliated me because you got man to sin against me? Okay, so I'm going to come down and... Hold on, hold on. I'm going to come down in a flesh body. And I am going to live a perfect life in a flesh body. I'm going to keep all 600 and something laws. I'm going to keep everything. I won't fail, not one bit. I will be perfect. And the Word became flesh and started dwelling amongst men. Watch. <laughs> oh, my God, my God. So, God Almighty. So, the Word became flesh, dwelt among men. And Satan's still trying to humiliate him. Jesus' time to die. Whip him with a cat of nine tails. He's trying to kill him. Put him on a cross, trying to just humiliate him. On the cross, he took the sin of every man who ever sinned on himself so that he could qualify to get entrance into hell. He who never sinned was made sin with our sin so he could qualify to have acceptance into hell. So, once in hell, Satan thinks, I won. I won. Ain't nothing else to do. I got to go to the party. Because <laughs> I got the Savior with me. Never look down. Hey, no more. Okay, we're in church. 
All right, now follow this now. Follow it. The first day, he thought he'd won. The second day, he thought he won. The third day. Remember, he was there for three days. Don't shout yet. He thought he won. And then Jesus said, okay, let me reveal to him what's really going on. Psst, hey, little punk. Come here, let me holler at you for a minute. Uh, can you find any record of me falling short or committing sin? I ain't got to. I mean, you, you, you had it all on you. Uh, that, that, that wasn't mine. I cut a deal with the same men you humiliated in the garden. I took all of their sin upon myself. I looked like I had sinned, but I never sinned, which means it is illegal for you to have me here. And in just a few moments, the Father is about to raise me up out of hell. and sit me on his right hand, glory to God. Now, let me explain to you what's going on. You will never be able to touch mankind again. And I'll tell you why. Because of my perfection in all of this, and I am still undefeated, I am now going to engraft all of mankind I'm going to take every man who will believe, I'm going to baptize him into me, and you can tempt him to sin all you want to. It'll never be counted because he is no longer being looked at in his own self. He is now being looked at through me and in Christ. You can't touch me, and you'll never touch a believer because every believer is on the inside of me, and if I'm righteous, they are righteous, and if I'm holy, they're holy, and if I have wisdom, they have wisdom, and if I'm sanctified, they got sanctified, and everything I am, they are. In other words, he was saying, devil, you can't touch this. The only thing he can do now is to see if he can find somebody who doesn't believe what Jesus did, seeking whom he may devour. But if you believe this gospel, if you believe this Jesus, if you stay connected with Jesus, I don't, come, I don't care what come, come hell or high water, I don't care how you fail, what you did, all that. If you believe Jesus, if you stay connected with Jesus, if you stay hooked up with Jesus, if you stay connected with the blood, if you stay hooked up with the blood of Jesus, Satan will never again be able to humiliate you. And if you focus on Jesus, you will have access to the dimension of the supernatural. That's now his attempt. How can I disrupt every man's focus so he won't start walking in who he is? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll take all my lies and 
and make it a part of philosophy, society, norms and values. I'll create things that men gravitate to and value. And within that, I'll make certain things so appealing that I'll do it again like I did Peter. Look at the wind. Look at the storms. Get your eyes off him. Look at the news. Look at the reports. Look at who said what. I'll get them to think that it is a wasteless, wasteless journey to focus on Jesus. And no man will ever get the revelation that the real battle is a battle of focus. Now who you, now who you looking at? What you looking at? You better open that Bible up so you'll know what it say so that you won't hear something that it didn't say. The question still remains, what, what were you going to do with immortal beings? And even when that day comes, were you going to cause the spirits of man to reunite with his body? I don't know how you're going to do that. Because even when they, when they, when they, when they uh, burn the bodies, they cremate the body, they ain't, they ain't got, you ain't got every one of them ashes. <laughs> they scoop, they put some in there and get you what you can. <laughs> you, you looking at your loved one like, dang, I thought they had more ashes than this. <laughs> but the dimension of the supernatural at the sound of his command, something like creation going to begin to rock the world. And every man's spirit going to re-enter a supernatural body that has access to the durable shot. You remember when Jesus, watch this, you're talking about access to the supernatural? You remember when Jesus, when he was raised from the dead? The Bible says, Jesus walking through the door, the door being shut. So his supernatural body had the ability to assemble itself around physical matter and end up on the other side. And if that wasn't proof enough, then he sat down and ate some fish and honeycomb. If that wasn't proof enough, he says, I am no longer operating solely into this natural dimension. I am now subject to a higher dimension. I have access to this dimension, but I move differently in this other dimension. And you telling me you're not excited about heaven? You're not excited about the return of the Lord? You're not excited about putting on your new body? You're not excited about what he promised you? I tell you, I'm so excited, I shall not be bound by the laws of this natural world. Focus. Focus. All of this stuff that's trying to steal my attention. Have you noticed he's using the same thing against you? Whatever you give your attention to the most, that's what you're more able to do. Whatever you don't give your attention to, check this out. That's what your heart is hardened to. Your heart is hardened to what you don't give attention to. No attention to the Word, no attention to Jesus. Your heart is hardened to that dimension of the supernatural. Why? No attention to it. You know, Taffy talked about this shift. I think a shift's going on this morning. I, I, I would have never dreamed that I would step out like this and talk to a group of people this way 
because I'm careful with who's in the room where they're a baby. They've never been, no, they've been on safe for two months. I mean, honey, it, it's, if you're a week old, if you're focused on Jesus, he going to do something that you did never think could be done in your life. It's just like Coach Prime say, we coming. <laughs> I say, we coming, devil, we coming. We coming. There's some supernatural things that will start working through you. The anointing is not just going to be in this pulpit. It is now in the congregation, praise God. And as you focus, as you focus, God's going to give you supernatural wisdom that makes you smarter than everybody in the company. God's going to give you supernatural healing that's going to make you healer and heal better than anybody. You be getting ready to walk above the natural. You getting ready to walk above the natural. You getting ready to walk above the laws that get, that, that the natural. You getting ready to walk in supernatural ability. You getting ready to cast out devils. You getting ready to lay hands on the sick. You getting ready to tell the storm to go. You getting ready to move in a a different way, hallelujah. So let me finish that story with Peter. So like Peter, we get distracted. That's one of the weapons of the enemy. Distracts, distracts, distracts. A distraction is an intrusion of the mind to try to cause confusion. But notice what happened when he got distracted. <laughs> he began to sink, the Bible says. But watch this. Here's your grace. But Jesus reached down. Pulled him up with him. And the Bible says, and they both walked back to the boat. <laughs> Child of God, let me tell you something. In your life, when you feel yourself sinking, leave your hands up there. Jesus is there. And whatever you started in the supernatural, with Jesus, you'll finish it in the supernatural. But you've got to get rid of all of this dead, empty philosophy and you've got to spend some time with the Lord so that you will know that you have an opportunity to walk this way. Yeah. Wants your mind. That's where the battle is. All outputs, and just like your focus on Jesus brings you into the dimension of the supernatural, your lack of focus on Jesus and focus on everything else I mean, y'all see where this is going? This, this is the game, if you will. This is, this, is, this is the stuff right here. Sometimes you'll have stuff to hit your thinking that's so tough. I promise you the best thing to do is to learn the vocabulary of silence. You have to learn. If you don't quite know what to do at the time, shut up. Be quiet. Somebody say, how long? Until that thing that's going on in your head subsides and peace comes back and you come back to yourself and now you're ready to talk. That's, that's what happens in a lot of relationships. A lot of relationships get in trouble because you don't know what you shut up. Be quiet. Can't talk right now. Hush. How long I got to be quiet? Until, you, until, until the soundness of the Jesus you know come back in you? Because if you're not careful, that attack will come, some, something will attack your head, and you'll start thinking all kinds of stuff. Your husband doing something, you think, I'm going to shoot that joker tonight, boy. You don't mean that, but it's just a thought. I'm going to shoot him. I'm going to tear I'm going to cut him with a butter knife. I'm going to... That's, that's the thing. That lets you know, ain't time to talk. Shut up. Be quiet. If we could learn the vocabulary of silence, a lot of stuff would be prevented from happening. Because you got a revelation. 
of if a man can control his tongue, he can control his whole body, and even in some cases control the circumstances and situations around him. But you just got to say something. God said, be quiet. I know you said, be quiet, Lord. But I'm going to have to say something with this right here now. I heard you loud and clear when you told me to be quiet. But I'm telling you right now, I'm in rebellion. Because I got three, four cousin words in my back pocket right now. I'm about to pull out and make them compound words in the name of the law. <laughs> Understand how this thing goes. And they both walk together back to the boat. Make sure that you make Jesus your walking partner. My time gone. I don't know how long we're going to be in this series, but that my time gone. You know how to walk in the supernatural. You need something to happen, quit begging God to make it happen and get your focus. Amen. And give attention more to him instead of more to empty philosophy. Yeah. You start seeing something. But if you don't give attention to him, your heart is hardened towards the Jesus you say you love. Your heart is hardened because of the no attention you're giving. Whoever you attend to the most. And what does it say in Proverbs? Attend to my word. Your heads. Bow your heads, close your eyes. I want to pray this prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, I, uh, I feel like I did what you wanted me to do today, and you know exactly the circle that everybody stands in today. You know the circle that everybody stands in today. You know the situation. You know the stuff coming against them. You know the hurt, the pain, the confusion. You know everybody in here. Ain't nobody in here outside of your knowledge of what's going on with them. By the Spirit of God, I moved out on this information. I pray by the Spirit of God, you do something so supernatural in the lives of everybody in here, everybody at the sound of my voice. Something click. Something that, that I could have never done with any sermon. Something that only you can do. We look to you. We look to you. Savior pour out supernatural ability all over this place. Pour out supernatural wisdom that even blows the mind of those who are receiving it. Let a leg or a knee that couldn't move start moving right now. Let eyes that couldn't see start seeing right now. Lord, give evidence of this word supernatural oh sheka oh give evidence of this word proof that this is so we now look to you we look to you Thank you for your grace. Thank you that in you we move and you we breathe and you we have our very being. It's your faith. We're in you. We're baptized in you. And the devil can't do us no harm. Now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, this dimension that Peter walked in, this dimension where Adam and Eve were created in, this dimension that Jesus demonstrated. Let us see it. Teach us, Holy Spirit. You said you will teach us all things. Teach us, Holy Spirit. Teach us, Holy Spirit. Let us believe and receive.
see this shift into this supernatural dimension. Oh, glory. From the back row all the way to the front and the balconies through the E-Church, Holy Spirit, move. We receive it now. We believe it now. Soften our hardened hearts. Jesus' name. Everybody at the sound of my voice, would you lift your hands up as if, as if you're receiving a gift? Lift your hands up as if you're receiving a gift. Lift your hands as if you're receiving something from on high. An endowment. Something that was always meant to be yours. We receive it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Ooh. Ooh. Let's receive our offering right now. If you need an offering envelope, raise your hands. All throughout the day, this message is going to start dealing with you. You're going to start seeing stuff I, I didn't say. And you are not going to be limited by what you see, what you hear, or the reports. The shift has taken place in this church. In Jesus' name. What a delight it is to bring glory to his name. Bring an offering and magnify him and worship him in the beauty of his holiness. Bring an offering. Wow. Those of you who are in our e-church participate with this as well those of you who are at home watching this on another platform participate in this i am going to teach you will never understand how impactful giving is that's why it has to be a heart issue not a percentage issue Everything in the New Testament is weighed by the heart. Is it coming out of your heart or is it coming out of some obligation that needs to be fulfilled? No, no, no. This is a relationship. And in a relationship, things come out of your heart, not obligation. And to be able to give out of your heart and not out of fear and obligation Amazing. Amazing. Woo. My God, I need a donut. <laughs> I, 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 I just feel the presence of God. And I sense it on you. Now, don't you desensitize it. It's on you. Receive it. Keep it. And they that know their God will do exploits. Amen. Let's just go ahead and receive the offering this morning. I enjoy teaching here. Maybe I want to go nowhere else. Right before we dismiss today, if you're here and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, 
I mean, be serious now. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life and you get an opportunity to correct that, wouldn't you want to do it? If this is the brook where God's calling you to and you get an opportunity to get there, shouldn't you want to do it? Right now, if you've never been born again, if you've never made Jesus your Lord and personal Savior, I want you to be so bold and come down to this altar because the altar is a place of change. You're saying, I'm going to get born again today. Secondly, if you need to recommit yourself to that relationship you used to have with him, you, you got born again, but you're just like, I don't know. Let's re-engage that relationship. Thirdly, if you want the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and receive that. And last but certainly not least, if you believe that God is calling you to join this church, World Changes Church International, and you're like, hey, I'm, I'm, I think this is the brook where I'm supposed to be, then get here. Get here. I've given to you four things, an opportunity to get born again, to recommit yourself to Jesus, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and to join this church. Come on down, come on down, come on down. Amen. I will exalt you. I will exalt you. I will exalt you. You are my God. You got it? hiding place. hiding place one more time my hiding place my safe refuge my treasure lord you are my friend and anointed one most holy I will exalt you. I will exalt you. I will exalt you. You are my God. Congregation, don't you appreciate those who have come to this altar today.
Father, I pray that you will cause them to be extremely blessed in your presence, that every burden be removed and every yoke be destroyed. And we give you all the honor and the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. At this time, if you'll follow this gentleman to the prayer room, they're going to take you, minister to you, give you a biblical understanding of how to obtain and maintain what you came to receive. And we thank God that you will never be the same again. Several months ago, we sold a physical church into the life of another church. I mean, we gave it to them debt-free, had it fixed up, everything. It's the former Marietta Church. And the Spirit of God told us to do this, and we later on found out that the pastor had been believing for that location for over 20 years. Well, tonight at 6 p.m., we're going to formally go and dedicate that building into the ministry of Enlightened Christian Center. Uh, it's located 601 Tower Road, Northeast Marietta, Georgia. If you'd like to stop by, if you're not doing anything, um, you can. Just wanted to let you know that. Let's go ahead and get you guys out of here. Praise the Lord, football season has begun. I love it. <laughs> now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be on you. May the angels carry out all of God's commands to watch over you and to protect you lest you should dash your foot against the stone. May you walk in unmerited favor, doors opening for you that you wonder how they open. May God protect you from the devil's plans and strategies and lift you up now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you. We love you. Have a great day.